when you get inside of a survival situation, your body will think self-preservation. But I want to make a statement because when it comes to thriving versus just surviving, self-preservation isn't good for us. Let me just say it this way. Self-preservation, it works for you in surviving situation, but it will work against you in a thriving situation. We are week three in a series called Thrive. We really felt like going into this new year, 2021, that we would talk about what does it mean to thrive? Even if the world for you is chaotic and crazy, or maybe it's okay and mediocre, but we've been called to live to thrive. That's the promises of Jesus. But he also said, when you follow me as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, we will learn the secrets and the art that Jesus knew how to thrive regardless of the world around him. And he, we, he knew how to thrive from the inside out. So this has been a fun journey for us as we talk about thriving. You know, one of the things that we've been saying is a lot of us are using more survival language that we're just getting by or I'm not really experiencing the full life that I can have in Jesus. How do I tap into that? How do I experience that? So if you're joining us, this is a perfect time as we unpack the secrets of following Jesus, following in his rhythms of the patterns of how he lived his life so that we can learn to thrive. You know, we talk about survival. A lot of times experts will tell us that we have mechanisms inside of us or instincts, if you will, of survival. You know, we say it in terms like this, when you're in a situation and you have to survive, do you fight or do you flight? That's, you don't even have to think about it. You get somebody sneaks up on you and they want to scare you and your instinct is either to fight or to flight. The whole idea behind that is that there's self-preservation and it's instinctive inside of you that in your face with the situation, your mind and body will do whatever it takes to have to survive because it needs to preserve itself, self-preservation. You know, when I think of my family, I gotta be honest with you guys, I have one of those quirky things that if you sneak up on me or wake me up in the middle of the night, my kids know this, I feel so bad for them. I can't tell you how many times my kids have, they've been startled by something or they heard something in the middle of the night and then they come in and wake me up. And if I'm dead in a sleep, like I'm, I'm out cold in a deep sleep, I have one of those instinctive reactions to kind of, well, let me just put it this way. Uh, I, I do the fight thing, not the flight thing. There's been a couple of times my poor kids uh, will come in the middle of the night and out of just fear, instinctively, I'll, I'll like kick one of them in the leg or something like that. It's actually kind of embarrassing. But the reality is that I, I don't even think about it. It's just something that happens when you get inside of a survival situation, your body will think self-preservation. But I want to make a statement because when it comes to thriving versus just surviving, self-preservation isn't good for us. Let me just say it this way. Self-preservation, it works for you in surviving situation, but it will work against you in a thriving situation. Here's what I mean by that. Everything inside of us, it just oozes self-preservation. So when Jesus shows up on the scene and he tells the disciples, and we said this last week if you joined us, that the first rhythm to living, the first rhythm to really thriving is learning how to die, which is the opposite of self-preservation. In fact, I'll, I'll make another statement and say it this way. Self-preservation is the enemy of spiritual realization. If you want to realize all that God has for us to thrive spiritually, Self-preservation will be an enemy that you're going to have to chase down and wrestle with every day. The opposite of dying is self-preservation. Isn't it true that every time you get into an argument, you feel defensive, what happens? That is you stepping out of self-preservation to protect yourself versus I'm going to walk in humility. I'm going to be honest and broken. That's what it it means to die to self. I'm going to die to my ego. I'm going to walk in humility. But self-preservation is all about ego, making sure that I still look good, that I, I still have the appearance, that I'm smart, that I've got all the answers. That's just one way that our self-preservation of our ego can work against us when we really need to die to that so that we can walk in the thriving life that God has for us. And the list is a mile long of all the ways that our self-preservation wants to keep us from truly thriving. And if we don't learn the art of what it means to die to Christ, die to self, we're never really going to move forward in learning how to thrive. So today, here's what I want to do. I want to give us 
three more ways as we continue from last week. How do we learn the secret that Jesus did of dying to self so we can live to Christ? It is the first rhythm. Before we talk about any other rhythms, we have to learn the first one, which is this, what Jesus said. If you pick up your cross daily and follow me, you're going to have to die to yourself so that you can experience the full life that I have for you. But isn't it true? It is a lot of hard work when we think about dying to self because your self-preservation is going to kick in every day and you're going to have to be guarding against that. And we have to walk in the place of learning how do we truly die? And so I want to give us just three practical ways. Number one is this. Dying is trusting. We sort of touched on this last week. Dying is trusting. Let me show one example in the Old Testament of God's people that he promised them to go to the promised land. If I could just change some titles, he didn't just promise them a land. It was a thriving land. When they got there, it wasn't just the bounty of the land and the abundance of all the resources that were there physically. It was also a metaphor for them living the promised land spiritually. So here is the picture we have. God promises this place for them to thrive. But as we look at the journey, it was a journey of trust. And this is what it says. I'm going to read to you in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 27. If you'll notice the one thing, the only thing that kept them from entering into the promised or the thriving land was they didn't know how to trust. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 1, 27. Speaking of the people, when they faced hard times, it says this, you grumbled in your tents. How many of us, we're seeing a lot of grumbling, right? Come on, let's be honest with ourselves. I do the same thing. When life is hard, isn't it easy to resort to a place of grumbling? Woe is me. Poor is me. Self-preservation kicks right in. I need to feel sorry for myself. I need to feel the, the sympathy for myself. I, and this is what we all do. We go to that place of self-pity and we blame God. So here's what it says. They say, this is quoting what they said. They came to the conclusion the Lord must hate us. They grumbled because things weren't going right. Even though God said, listen, there's going to be hard things. There's going to be ups and downs in the journey to the thriving land, but you're going to have to trust me. But of course, they did what we all do. We can't be hard on them. That every time life gets hard, instead of trusting, we tend to grumble. And, that's, and we end up projecting onto God and blaming him. This is what they said. The Lord hates us, so he's brought us out of Egypt, delivering us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. And then it goes on to say this. They question, where can we go? And now this next statement I find is something that all of us may have to be honest about. This next statement says this. Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. How many of you right now, you feel that your heart is melting in fear? Or would you say you're thriving in trust? Most of us, we will always be in a place of bondage if we let fear own us. Fear is something we all wrestle with. Fear of our kids, fear of our marriage, fear of our jobs, fear of the economy, fear of what's going on in the world. We have so many, all of us. We don't know the future, and so we insert fear instead of trusting. Come on, we all wrestle with this. But then it goes on to say this, that they made their hearts fear and melted in fear. Why? What did they say? Here's what it says. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Now, you don't have any idea who these people are. Let me break it down for you. God said, I'm going to get you through this. Trust me, trust me, trust me. You're going to have to die to fear. Fear will cause you to focus more on the size of your problem than the size of God's faithfulness. If you and I turn and trust, it's when we begin to see life's circumstances from how big God is, not how big our problems are. But if you let fear capture your hearts and hold you hostage, you will never, never learn how to thrive. Come on, this is something I wrestle with too. I'm with you on this. But here's what happens next. Let me just continue reading in verse 32. This is a reminder. Moses gives him the reminder and says this, in spite of this, you did not, here's the word, you did not trust in the Lord your God. And then he reminds them who went ahead of you on your journey. He already planned it out. Some of you need to hear this right now. You don't know what tomorrow is, but God's already gone ahead of you. Part of trusting is knowing that God is already He's one step, two steps, 10 steps, a thousand steps ahead of us before we even know it or not. 
And so Moses is, re is reminding them, why in the world would you panic? Why in the world would you size up your fear and your faith and you would come out on the other side believing more in what to fear than believing in the faithfulness of God? And he says, because this is what happened. You lost sight of what God already did. And he's reminding them, you didn't realize this, but God had demonstrated that. It says that in fire by night, he went ahead of you. Remember that? Remember how God already showed his faithfulness? That he showed up in the pillar at night with fire. Remember how he came in the cloud by day? He searched out places for you to camp. He showed you the way you should go. He's like, there's no reason for you to be consumed with fear. But you're not dying to the fear and you haven't died to it in such a way that now it's consuming you and it's keeping you from the promised land. And this is what it says in verse 35. He says it this way. No one from this evil generation, none of you will see the good, thriving, promised land I swore to give your ancestors. Except, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he will see it and I will give him and his descendants to the land as they set their feet in it. Why? Because he followed me wholeheartedly or he followed me fully trusting. You know, the language that's used here, there's different pictures. Let me explain it this way. I would say that trusting is tasting. Remember, the Bible tells us, taste and see that the Lord is good. When we trust God, what we're doing is we're actually tasting his faithfulness. You know, last week we talked about two types of trust. There's the one kind of trust that says, I intellectually believe in something, like a chair. I believe intellectually that if I sit in it, then it's going to hold me. But there's a different type of trust, the trust that actually acts on that, goes beyond just intellect. It actually moves out in faith and it experiences God's faithfulness. You have to sit in it. If I was to use another illustration of cooking and food, you know, one of my favorite meals to eat. I'm a big, big lover of steaks. Everybody knows that. I love a steak. One of my favorites is a ribeye tomahawk steak. I love those. I will scurry the land. I will find them. And I love making a thick, juicy tomahawk ribeye steak. I'm addicted to them. I love them. They're just something about the process of cooking them over the fire, the spices, and then that beautiful, delightful worship moment. When you dive into it, you take a bite, the juices just ooze down in your mouth and throat. Your taste buds come alive. Am I making anybody hungry? Can I get an amen? This is what I'm talking about. But see, listen, I can watch all the YouTube videos on how to cook a ribeye. I can even read all the textbooks on what is a ribeye. I can explain it to somebody as long as I want to, but until I actually bite into it and taste it. See, they were crippled because they allowed fear to melt their hearts. When we trust, we taste God and we allow his promises to melt in our mouth. There's some of us, we are really good at approaching God intellectually. We can have our theology down right. But until we actually die to our fears that want to consume us, that want to own us, we'll never learn how to fully thrive. You know, if I was to illustrate it, let me put it in a chart this way. This might help you. All of us go into seasons of testing. All of us. Maybe some of you are in a season of testing right now. We all go into times of testing. And when by, what I, by testing, what do I mean? That when you go through hard circumstances and the giants you're facing seem so overwhelming, the odds seem against you, you have to make one of two choices. Am I going to a place of trusting? And when I take the path of trusting, I'll begin to taste and see that God is good. But if I don't go the path of trusting, which leads to tasting, I'll go down another path, which is the path of tempting. And tempting always leads to a conclusion of thieving, robbing you of your thriving life. The best example I can give you is this. The Bible talks about we have two Adams in the Bible. Most of us are only familiar with the first Adam. When you go back to the beginning of the Bible, it starts with the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. It's called the first Adam of the human race. And what happened in that situation? God created this bounty, this garden, this Eden, which means delight. Do you delight in me? And this was a place that God created for them to thrive. And, and the Bible tells us there were only two human beings that were ever created that didn't enter the world with sin. Adam and Eve 
And then a third person later, which was Jesus. So when you compare, you have Adam in the garden. God created that to be a space of thriving if, if they would trust God. Remember, God said, you can eat whatever you want, just don't eat of that tree. What did, the, what did Satan, the enemy, do? He showed up and his number one temptation was, don't trust God. He's holding out on you. He's holding out on you. He created that tree over there. All of this is not good enough. What God's provided, not good enough. You got to step out of trusting and tasting what God has given and you got to go over here. That's the temptation every day that you and I face. In fact, I would tell you this. I believe that at the root of every temptation in life is the decision of do I trust God or do I trust something else? Of course, Adam failed miserably as the first representation of the human race because he stepped out of trusting and he chose in that moment of temptation to choose another way. And it robbed them of the garden. It robbed them of the thriving life. The Bible tells us there was a second Adam. It's in reference to Jesus. Jesus showed up and here he is, not in a garden now, he's in a wilderness. Notice the contrast. Jesus is now in the wilderness and he's starving. Satan shows up again. This mirrors the garden. This is Jesus now. He's the representation, the second Adam. What it happens with him? He actually passes the test where Adam failed. Jesus is tempted. Satan looks at him and says, if you're hungry, turn the stones into bread and eat it. And what was Jesus's response? Jesus trusted in the word of God. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the very word of God. Jesus knew in this moment, he could have taken things into his hand. This is why Satan looked at him. Well, if you're the son of God, you're empowered. Don't trust God, trust yourself. Turn the stones into bread. Don't trust God, trust yourself. Satan was trying his old trick that he did with Adam in the first garden. He's trying to do that on Jesus. But Jesus passed the test. Why? Because Jesus knew that the secret of thriving is trusting. When we trust God, we enter into his promises. It's when we ingest his promises, we hold dearly to his promises. And as we chew, as we feast on the promises of God and his faithfulness, our hearts turn to a place of trust, no matter what's going on around us. And it leads us to a place of thriving. I want to give you a second example of how do we really learn to die well. Not only do we die by trusting, but we die through living. Dying is loving. Dying is loving. If you want to live and thrive, you got to learn how to love. Dying is loving. Let me say this through the words of Jesus. In John chapter 15, he says this, I am the vine. I love that Jesus now is going to give us a picture and he's using agriculture here to help make this really easy to understand. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will, here's the thrive language, you will bear much fruit. And then he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You will not thrive. You will not bear fruit. You will not flourish apart from me. You got to remain in me, which may, makes the question come to the surface. Well, how do we remain? He goes on to tell us, this is how we do it. Verse six, he says, if you do not remain in me, you're going to be like the opposite of a thriving branch. You're not going to be the branch that's producing the fruit and flourishing. You're going to be the opposite. He says it this way, you're going to be like a branch that is thrown away and it withers. Do you see? The complete opposite of thriving is withering. Some of us right now may be feeling like, man, my life, I'm that branch right now. I'm not producing the flourishing fruit. I'm not thriving. I feel like I'm withering up and I'm decaying and, and life is not the fullest it's supposed to be. And then he goes on to say this. Here's how we know the secret to remaining, which leads to thriving and flourishing. He says it this way. He says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. And then he says this. If you, commit, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus said this, if you want to thrive, you got to learn how to love him first. This is why I would say this at the end of the day. If you really want to know how to, how to thrive, you got to die to self-love. Christ's love is the only thing that delivers us from self-love. Self-love will always lead us down a path of death and decay. But when we choose to deny ourselves, 
because we love Jesus more than we love ourselves, then that's where we remain. If you remember, Jesus said right here, how do you remain in my love? By abiding, by listening, by obeying my words. Now, I know when I say that, some of us go, that doesn't sit right with me. It, feel, it feels like legalism. You're telling me that Jesus says the way that we stay in his love is to do what he says? That's exactly what I'm saying. Jesus knew the art of loving his father even more than himself. Because Jesus said, whatever I do, whatever I speak, I only do what the Father tells me and I only say what the Father tells me to say. Jesus knew how to walk in obedience to the Father and the Spirit. And Jesus knew that as he loved his Father and loved the Spirit, that he would learn the art of thriving. See, many of us don't get it until I explain it this way. You get a new little puppy at your house. What's one of the first things you're going to do? You're going to put it on a leash when you take it for a walk. Why? Not because you're trying to hold back life. Not because you're trying to be controlling and manipulative. God gave us his word that we can obey. Not because God is trying to manipulate us. Not because we have this legalistic God. But you know it. You do that so that you can enjoy the fellowship of the walk with your cute little puppy. And to protect it. Because it doesn't have the ability in and of itself to know what's safe out there. God gives us his word that when we listen to it and when we obey it, it's out of love. You walk your dog on a leash because you love it. You want to protect it, care for it, see it live its greatest life of flourishing and thriving. When we listen to God's word, but it's going to require this, in order to obey God's word, at times, it's not going to agree with what you want. At times, you're going to have to choose between what I want and what God's word says. Am I going to love myself more or am I going to love God to the point? God, I love you so much that I'm going to trust you. I'm going to die to my self-love and I'm going to come alive by being obedient to your word. See, when I, when I unpack this, there's the language of agriculture here. And I'm going to show you two trees that we can either live from. On the one side, you got the self-loving tree and on the other side, you have the Christ-loving tree. In this tree, the self-loving tree, it's all about toxic fruit. How many of you know this, that if you just are full of yourself and loving yourself, it produces toxic fruit in your life? We know where that comes from. Anger, greed, jealousy. We don't know where it all comes from, but we know the root of that, the self-love, leads to that kind of toxic fruit. And the essence of that, that's moving through that tree, is all about death. And it's rooted in ego. But then here's the the Christ-loving tree. It's spiritual fruit. It's the essence of life. And it's rooted in love. When we choose that this is the tree that I want to be a part of, Jesus said, using like a, a vine and branches, the idea of being grafted into it. You know, the word grafting is an interesting word. It's a word we use in agriculture. It's the idea of taking a limb from another tree removing it, cutting it off, and then grafting it, inserting it into another tree. Here's the definition of grafting. To graft means this. It means a cutting of a stem that is then attached to a rootstock, and it's chosen for desirable traits, used for fruit production, disease resistance, maturity in size, and drought tolerance. What we're saying is this. When we are grafted into the life of Jesus, that's when we tap into his life source, and it comes into us, it restores us, and there's, there's fruit production of flourishing. And the way we stay grafted in is through love and obedience. Death to self, alive to Jesus, is the answer. You know, that little stem, when it's removed from another tree and it's grafted into a healthier tree, that little stem, which represents your life and my life, is called a scion. We know years ago they tried to make a car named the scion. But do you know what the actual word scion means? This is fascinating. The word scion actually means royal heritage, a noble identity. When you and I are grafted in, when we allow who God says who we are, and I allow my identity to be in alignment, or if I will, obedience to who God's word says that I am, I'm grafted into his life. It affects my entire identity. I begin to live out of the royal inheritance and the heritage. I am grafted. I am unified into the life of Christ. Many of us never live where our identity thrives. None of us, we rarely live in that place where we're no longer manipulated and controlled by the words around us, the haunting memories of regret that we have that all shame us. We never learn that place of thriving in who we truly are. 
is we don't know how to die to ourselves. We don't know how to die to our ego. We don't know how to die to the world's idea, idea of who we truly are. So if we want to learn how to thrive, we got to die. And dying is about loving Jesus more than ourselves. It's about loving his word more than the other words that we can align to. You know, the last way I would say that we die well, the last one is this. We learn how to die, and I would say it this way, dying is about dethroning. Dying is about dethroning. You know, when Paul would use the language, he would talk about dying to sin. Isn't it true that most of us, we know this, that when sin controls us, it always leads to death, not thriving. Many of us will never step into a place of thriving because we have addictions to certain patterns of sin that control us, these strongholds that we have. And if we don't know how to learn to die to sin, dethrone the sin from our lives, if that sin rules us, it will always hold us in a place of death and decay. We'll never know how to thrive. This is what the language that Paul uses in Romans chapter 6, verse 6. He says this, For we know that our old self... It was crucified. There's the death language. It was crucified with Christ so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. How many of you right now feel like, man, there's some sin in my life. I keep going back to the things. It's got this stronghold on me, addictions, way of thinking, patterns of my life. And I feel like it's just gripping me and I can't thrive because of the sin in my life. And he says it right here. He says, you don't have to be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has, here's the language, died has been set free from sin. And I love how it says this in verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's the language he uses right here. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And I love how this is mentioned, the same verse in the Passion Translation. This is what it says. Sin is a dethroned monarch. So you must no longer give it an opportunity to rule your life. You know, if I was to show two crowns representing what rules you, because the reality is this, what rules your heart will run your life. And if, if there's sin in your life that's ruling you, maybe for many of us, it's a pattern of jealousy. Maybe it's a pattern of fear. Maybe it's a pattern of anger. Maybe it's a pattern of resentment. You and I both know that it's out of those stronghold sins that cause us to be in the wrong space. And it doesn't lead us to a place of flourishing. How many of us have said things, done things, acted out because of those, those sinful things that control us? And we look back and we go, oh, how do I break free from that? We've been called to die to sin. If I was to show you right now two crowns representing what monarchy rules your life. On the one side, this is the throne of sin and it is a state of bondage and it is ruled by our flesh, our sinfulness. But then you have the throne of Christ and it's a state of freedom ruled by the spirit of God. You constantly see the tension throughout the Bible about the spirit and the flesh, what Jesus has called me to do, a life of freedom and deliverance. Yet I tend to, my flesh wants to keep going back and partnering with sin. You know, I would say it this way. There's a difference between having a problem with sin and having a pattern of sin. You know, we all have a problem with sin. Every day, all of us have problems. None of us are perfect. We're all going to have things that we do that we sin. But a pattern of sin means this. There's one or two or three specific sins that have become your addiction. These sins are holding you in bondage. And you feel so much guilt. You feel much, so much sense of defeat that you can't overcome that. And we're going to learn over the next several weeks through life in the spirit, picking up next week, how do we truly break free from being held bondage to sin? How do we truly walk in the spirit to liberate us from the tyranny of sin in our life? We're going to talk about that next week. But before we do that, I want us to make a decision right now. As we wrap up, most of us have to understand that those patterns of sin in our life, usually those patterns reveal idols. As it's been said before, the human heart is an idol factory. Isn't it true that when we look at patterns of our sin, those patterns seem to bring to the surface some idol that we tend to worship. And idols want you to be in bondage with patterns of sin. But we've been called to live in liberation from that. And I don't know about you, but I would love for you right now to go, what is your idol that's manifesting in patterns of sin? Many of us, an idol can be anything, even a good thing. 
can become an idol if it means more to us than God does. Sometimes our children can be an idol. Our marriages can be an idol. Our work can be an idol. Sports can be an idol. I would say it this way. Politics can be an idol. Isn't it true that in our nation over the last several weeks and months and days, we have seen a lot of idolatry through politics. Even I would say this, there's been a lot of emperor worship in our nation, which has just manifested those idols, which then leads to patterns of sin. And so we know that we have to do one of two things. We can either embrace those idols or we purge them. We either embrace them or we purge them. Because we've been called to die to that sinful life. We've got to do some dethroning of some idols. And this is what I would say in the last verse I'm going to share with you. It's found in Proverbs 25, verse 5. And if you purge corruption, watch what happens. If you purge corruption from the kingdom... A king's reign will be established. See, you can't really have sin ruling and Jesus ruling. There's got to be some dethroning of some idols. And you and I both know those idols, they speak empty promises to you. These idols say if you give them all of your heart, they're just going to lead you down a path of disappointment. So we have to do some purging. We have to turn And say, I'm going to die to those idols. I'm going to die to that. And I'm going to come alive to a 100% allegiance to Jesus. I'm going to walk in obedience to him. I'm going to live life in the spirit. And as we do that, we're going to walk in freedom. So here's the question I want to end with is right now. Ask the Lord to reveal to you any idols that he wants you to purge. That's the first question I'm going to ask you. Ask the Lord. He's not going to shame you with that. The Holy Spirit will reveal that because he loves us so much. Is there any idols in your life? that he wants you to purge. The second question is this, are you polishing any idols in your life right now? See, many of us, when this question comes up, we might say, no, 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 I'm gonna justify it. I really need this in my life. I really gotta put my hope in this. I'm gonna really hold on to that. Many of us, we're not doing purging, we're just polishing idols. And we've been called to not polish idols, but to purge them. And I believe that if we are honest with ourselves and God, he'll show us those things so that we can turn and die to them. As we die to them, we purge them, we turn, and Jesus takes his rightful place at the throne of our lives. And I'm going to invite us right now as we close up, will you join me in that honest prayer together? So Jesus, we come before you. We thank you that you liberate us, that you come with the language of thriving, that we thrive by trusting you. We thrive by remaining in your love. That when we are so overwhelmed by the love you have for us, when we know how much you love us, it allows us to do nothing but sit, rest, soak in your embrace of affection and approval for us. Why would we want anything that has to do with self-love when we can be completely delivered in love from you? And Jesus, you've also called us to purge idols, to die to those things, to say yes to your life and your spirit, to trust in your word. And so I pray right now for all of us that we would simply say, Holy Spirit, is there any idols in my life that I've been polishing? Is there any idols that I've been justifying, that I've been making excuses around, that I've been entertaining? Is there any of those things? I pray, Holy Spirit, would you reveal those now? And would you give us the faith, the boldness to trust you, to obey your word, and to purge those from our lives. The Bible language is repentance. We turn. Jesus, we declare right now no allegiance to those idols, but allegiance to you. And I pray, Jesus, as we all step into that space of humility and transparency and honesty, I believe that we will begin the path of dying to those things and coming alive and thriving that you have for us. I pray that we would walk in that. I ask you, Holy Spirit, now, would you lead us in that? I ask you, Jesus, would you allow your love to overwhelm us right now, wherever we are, as broken as we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what's been done to us, that we would learn to really remain in your love and to trust you. And we pray these things in Jesus' amazing name. Amen. God bless you guys. Can't wait to see you next week. And we'll look forward to that time together. God bless you.